All right, I'm going to talk about uh, a number of things. All of them will have to do with complexity in some form or another. Oh, what is the title of the talk? What I learned from amps. Um, a lot. I'm not going to go through the things I learned from amps. I'm going to tell you about um, some things I find interesting. Some things I find interesting. They all have. They all revolve around complexity and um, its possible relationship with black holes. But let me take five, just five minutes out and uh, sort of almost an aside to tell you one thing about complexity that um, that I, I find very interesting. Nobody ever talks about it, but I think it's quite relevant. The notion of two states. When I say states, I mean collections of qubits, to be uh, to be specific. The the notion that two states are either far from each other or close to each other. What does it mean? Now, there's a standard metric in Hilbert space. Not in Hilbert space, but on the uh, unit spheres in Hilbert space. C, P, whatever it is. And that standard metric, I think, is called the Fubini study metric. Studi is it study? Studi? I don't know what the. Uh, right. Uh, the Fubini study metric, which is basically the natural metric you get from the inner products. <coughs> the inner products of two states define, uh, that, well, define an angle between the two states. And then the arc uh, cosine of that angle is the uh, metric distance between two points. That's notion that um, that's very standard. But, for example, it doesn't reflect certain features of the possible complexity difference between states. What I have in mind is something like this. I could take two states of a large number of qubits, and I'd scramble them up pretty well, and uh, a pure state, and now hit the system with a one qubit operator. It's very easy under those circumstances to turn it into an orthogonal state. In other words, to make it as far from the initial state as you can get using the Fubini study metric. But in some other sense, it's not very far. I only flip one qubit. It's awfully damn close. So hard to tell the difference. And the other, another fact, these two states that I got, which are orthogonal to each other, and as far as possible, are not very difficult to superpose, to make quantum superpositions of. They're just superpositions of one qubit in one state, and they're fairly easy to make superpositions of. Is there a notion of distance which really reflects something else, which reflects, let's call it, how hard it is to get from one state to another state? How many steps do you have to take to go from one step to another step? <coughs> the steps I'm thinking about now are gates in a quantum circuit, if you know about it, you know about it. If you don't, let's just call it the number of primitive basic steps you have to take to go from one to another. And that's also a kind of notion of, um, of the distance between states. Technically, you define it's simplest to start with the definition of the complexity of unitary operators. Technically, it's the number of gates that you have to compound in order to make the unitary operator. But if you have a notion of the complexity of operators, then the notion of complexity of states, or sorry, I want to talk about the relative co complexity of two states. The relative complexity of two states. So I have a psi and a phi. And supposing we take all the, unit, all the unitary operators that can connect them, then the minimum complexity unitary operator defines the relative complexity of psi and phi. In other words, the cheapest way with the smallest number of gates that you can construct to get from phi to psi, I'll call a relative complexity of the two uh, of the two states. So your Hilbert space comes with as a tensor product of a bunch of small dimensional things. Yeah, that's right. It's a tensor product of a small number of dimensional things. Sorry, a large number of small dimensional things. And in addition, there's a notion of simplicity of operations. You can call it local if you like, but what it means is it involves a small number of degrees of freedom. Um, where? All right, so the, so the complexity of the smallest or the cheapest unitary, the cheapest in gates, defines the relative complexity of psi and phi. It's symmetric in psi and phi, and it's positive. So it's some kind of measure of the distance between the states. 
You can do the same thing with two unitary operators. If you have two unitary operators, u and v, then you can define the relative complexity to be the complexity of u v dagger, which is just the number of gates that you have to hit u with to get to v, or v with to get to u. So these, these are notions that I'm going to use as we go along. Are these things continuous in this, the parameters? That there is, yeah, uh, there, are they, uh, which parameters now? Well, you know, if I take the states in some basis, yes. there are a bunch of complex numbers. Yes. And if I change the complex numbers just a little bit, does the complexity distance? Sometimes, that's an interesting question, which, which can we talk about it afterwards? It's very interesting. I want to ignore it for now. I don't think it's relevant. Uh, there are certain very perverse situations where the gate complexity can be very large and the angle between the states and the Fubini 30 cents can be small. That can happen. But I, I want to ignore that, uh, that, uh, that unpleasantness. Uh, good. All right. So we have some notion then of distance between states, which measures how hard it is in some sense to get from one to the other. And I think it's also useful when thinking about quantum measurements. Supposing I want, supposing somebody has constructed for me the state psi plus phi. Or maybe it's psi minus phi, I don't know. And I want to do an experiment on it, which is sensitive to the relative phase. Right? I want an apparatus to do an experiment that's going to be sensitive to the relative phase. That apparatus has to be complicated enough to be able to cause transitions between psi and phi. That means that that, operate, that apparatus has to have, if it's built out of local operations, it has to have a complexity. The operation of going from one to the other has to have a complexity which is as big as the relative complexity of psi and phi. So that's, at least in some cases, why it's hard to make superpositions of states because it's hard to get from one to the other. It's also hard to make measurements that involve superpositions of these things. You can imagine a complexity cutoff. Imagine a complexity cutoff that's a new kind of cutoff I'm going to put into physics. I'm going to say, we're not allowed to ever measure any, uh, we're never allowed to do a measurement that corresponds to a complexity bigger than a certain amount. Then we might say that in that context, relative phases between certain kinds of states would be irrelevant, and you could never tell the difference between a pure state and an incoherent mixture of these states. Now, I think you can probably tell where I'm going. Where I'm going is to say that perhaps there's some natural sense in the interior of a black hole that there's a complexity cutoff on the kind of experiments that can be done from within a black hole. If a black hole has a certain radius and a certain time that it takes before you hit the singularity, there's a maximum number of basic simple operations you can do. And I think it may be useful to try to quantify the limits of experimental physics behind the horizon in terms of the idea of relative complexity. Is there a natural relative complexity <coughs> bound? Uh, not a bound on the states that can be made. The states can be made from outside the black hole, but, about, but states that can be interfered from within the black hole and measured from within the black hole. I think the answer is yes, but uh, it's an interesting thought. I may come back to it if I have a chance. OK, so let me, um, let me talk about what I, th what I think about the firewall problem. And again, I don't pretend to by any means to have a complete solution to it, despite what I may have uh, sent out in that paper that I sent out uh, yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was having fun on my birthday. OK, um, some of you got it, some of you didn't. OK, so first of all, I'm going to assume the complexity volume, complexity volume duality. I talked about that the last time I was here. Some of you may not have been here. So I'll describe it a little bit. Uh, what it has to do with is the growth of Einstein-Rosen bridges. If we believe that uh, entangled black holes are connected by bridges, these bridges grow with time. And uh, they grow with time in a particular way. They grow linearly with time, classically. 
And the, what is it that grows? The volume of the Einstein-Rosen bridge grows. Just to uh, draw the picture, this is a standard picture. Here's the bridge at time t equals zero. There's no bridge at all. Here's the bridge a little bit later. It's growing. A little bit later, it's growing. And with some rule about how you slice it, and I've described that rule several times, I won't do it again. With some rule about how you slice it, the bridge grows linearly with time, the length of it. Also, the volume of it grows linearly with time. And it seems very likely uh, that the quantity in the CFTs, in the two CFTs that is growing, is the complexity of the quantum state. The relative complexity of the quantum state relative to the thermal field double state. How hard is it to get from one to the other? OK, so the, uh, the quantitative relationship is that the complexity at a time t, the complexity at time t is the volume of the Einstein-Rosen bridge, that's the, uh, that's the interior, divided by G Newton times LADS. But the important point is, uh, and, and as I said last time, last time means when I was here two weeks ago or so, this has been tested in various kinds of ways by sending in shock waves and seeing how the shock waves, how the geometry uh, uh, responds to the shock waves, and at the same time thinking of shock, wave, uh, shock waves as parts of quantum circuits, parts of quantum circuits and evaluating the uh, complexity using uh, quantum circuit theory, one finds that this relationship here seems to stand uh, some tests. Okay, so that's interesting because what it tells us, first thing it tells us, we didn't, we didn't need this, we didn't need complexity to tell us this, that a black hole, this could be a one-sided black hole too, one-sided black hole also, this is an ADS one-sided black hole, this is R equals zero, R equals infinity. Um, the interior of the one-sided black hole also grows with time. Okay, so something's growing. Looks like it's complexity, complexity of the quantum state, and that's interesting. Okay. Now, the fact that black holes grow from the interior <coughs> is part of what I think makes them black holes. If I were to take a ensemble of states <coughs> A har random, people love har random. I like to say that, har random, har random. If I were to take a har random uh, uh, ensemble of states, it would have equal likelihood of having white holes and black holes. Okay? It's time reversal invariant. White holes are certainly unstable. Whether they produce firewalls, whether, whether the resolution of their instabilities is firewalls or not, they're certainly unstable. They're like contracting cosmologies. This here is like an expanding cosmology. White holes are like contracting cosmologies. And contracting cosmologies are notoriously unstable because any perturbations you put into them get blue shifted. So they get singular very quickly. Um, expanding geometries have much less of a tendency to go singular just because they're red shifting things. So what I would say is a real black hole, one which is demonstrably a black hole and not a white hole. Talk about what that means in a minute, but that those things, by their very nature, are growing in the interior. Other things, like contracting black holes, I will call white holes. Now, I think there are all sorts of gray holes, holes which are in between white and black. Um, and We'll talk about them in a minute. A state which has both a white hole and a black hole in it is called gray. I'm going to call it gray. Okay. <laughs> right. That's different from a superposition right. of a white and a black. Yes. Whatever. whatever. <laughs> you can't decide. Right. right. I think what it means in classical physics is that there's a singularity in both the past and the future. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you right. call the eternal black hole gray. Well, the, well, OK. It depends on now how you think about the eternal black hole. I like to imagine the eternal black hole was made simple was made in the thermal field double state by Alice and Bob, who had some shared pairs, and created All right. Then it started simple, and it evolved to complexity. If you like to think that the eternal black hole is eternal into the past, and it started possibly complex, and it evolved to simplicity, wow, that's crazy. 
No wonder it's unstable. Things which start, yeah, that's a, and then evolve back to, um, yeah. Okay, so let's talk about the space of states. The space of states. Well, Lenny, maybe it's worth saying that you, I mean, when you have when you have something that we're a situation where entropy is decreasing. Yeah. Right? It, it's certainly unstable, but usually what we say is that you know if you breathe on it or something, then it flips back to a state where entropy right, exactly. is increasing. Right. Exactly. 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 I and, think that's generally. I think that's true of complexity so that, also. Right. But but then it turns. You might think that it turns back into a black hole. Uh, as opposed to a firewall or something. Yeah, yeah. Or some well, of yeah, I, okay, but look, take a look. Yeah, we know, know, for example. I know from the picture it doesn't right, look like that. Right. But I, picture I, I just have trouble. Let me just, let me just, I know you know. Um, <laughs> this geometry is just manifestly unstable with respect to creating nasty things on the horizon. This is the Schenker Stanford um, shockwave phenomenon that if you put a very, very weak perturbation in, meaning drop in one photon of thermal wavelength, long in the past, the longer in the past that you drop it in, the more severe will be the shock wave along here. Along the, so I would say, I understand what you said, but I would say just from experience, it really does look like this past history here tends to make the horizons unstable. Well, okay. I don't, I don't, that's what I say. It's true. Yeah, it's true. Okay. Now, incidentally, I don't want to be talking about exact thermal field double. The exact thermal field double has an extra symmetry, which I think really makes it stable uh, against firewalls forever. I want to think about slight deviations. And the slight deviations, if the deviations are in the past, they can make shock waves. If they're in the future, maybe not. But um, right, so I want to now draw the history of a black hole as a graph or as a couple of graphs. My assumption is this could be the one-sided black hole. And the assumption is that it starts from some simple state, a state of low complexity, for example, a bunch of unentangled particles. A bunch of unentangled particles will just define to be a simple state and then evolve it. So a bunch of unentangled particles come in. And let's talk about its history. So its history, I'll plot by plotting two quantities, the entropy and the complexity as a function of time. Now, by the entropy, I mean the coarse-grained thermal entropy. Um, it starts out with very little entropy. The cloud comes together. It has very little entropy. And then the entropy starts to evolve, and it comes to thermal equilibrium. How long does that take? Well, maybe it's scrambling time or something like that. But whatever it is, it's polynomial in the entropy. It's not very long. It, uh, for a solar mass black hole, I think it's about a millisecond. That's the scrambling time. So entropy starts to increase, and then, be, and then in an instant, it saturates. How much does it grow to? This axis here, of course, um, is uh, I've drawn it as a small, but I'm comparing it with exponential things. I want to compare that with the complexity growth. And the complexity growth is expected to grow for a very long time before it saturates. It cannot grow bigger than e to, it's bounded. It's bounded in the way that it grows. It's bounded by something called the marvelous Leviton theorem. Some of you may know that. And it tells you that it cannot grow faster than linear. And um, there's a natural slope to the linearity. The natural slope to the linearity, the bound, is the energy of the system itself, its mass. I sometimes use temperature times entropy, but they're almost the same thing. OK, so it, uh, that's the way complexity increases. And again, the complexity is the minimum number of gates that it takes to get there. And then it saturates. It can't get bigger than e to the s. And so that exponential time, it stops increasing. The implication of that for me is that the black hole geometry grows, the interior black hole geometry grows classically along a line like this, the volume of it growing linearly, until quantum phenomena happen, 
that ruin the classical geometry. What are those quantum phenomena? Exponential large time, e to the t, uh, sorry, e to the e to the s. All kind elephants can come out of the black hole and so forth. And so the classical geometry, I think, must break down at an exponential time. The classical global geometry. Was there a question? I yeah. was going to say that just classically, I believe the interior is unstable and that the growth will cease. On average, it would actually. Unstable, I have to. Shrinking. Why? It's because you have the approach to a singularity has sort of. No, 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 no. Uh, that's. Okay. You're choosing a rather special set of slices. It goes to a sequence of Kasner stages. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm doing something well, different. Getting close to the singularity. I'm not moving these surfaces up to the singularity. This is space like evolution inside the interior. Yeah. It's moving it's space. They're like maximal slices. Yeah. But uh, the particular definition that I've used, which is a useful one because it keeps you away from the singularity and the slices are nice, is to anchor the slices on the boundary at a fixed time and take the slices to be maximal volume slices. Then they never get near the singularity because of the singularity, the radius goes to zero. And so they're repelled away from the singularity. And they asymptote to a, to a curve like this. Now, is this, is this a good way to think about the interior of the black hole? Perhaps not. We'll never get to this place over here. The most important thing is that it's a gauge invariant way of describing some phenomena that's time dependent and that needs to be translated into the dictionary of the uh, CFT. So I would say, I think it's established that it's, um, or reasonably established that it is complexity. These are awfully artificial slices in the same sense that the old nice slices were, right? It's well, artificial or not. I mean, I got used to thinking about them, and I find them easy to think about. But uh, yeah. if you were to define slices by sending in an array of clocks, for yeah, example, it wouldn't be this. something. You know, it would not be this. this. Right. It would not be this. This, this maximal slice, that you, the last yeah. one that you drew, is yeah. that the saturation mm. point, or is that? No, no, that's a classical. That's a classical that's a curve. Purely classical. That's a classical that's curve, that's and it's infinite. It's infinite. It's infinite. And there's a symmetry along it. There's um, time translation symmetry along it. It's just that time goes sideways inside yeah, the yeah, black hole. Sure. Yeah. So why would it not be this if you send an array of clocks? So you send a clock at every time, and then. Oh. Those slices go. Oh, if you sent the clock, <laughs> if you sent the clock that only read that long until yeah. Oh, yeah, well, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, yeah, you yeah, 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 have yeah. clocks <laughs> where the laps go to <laughs> zero. Yeah. No, no, you just, no. you just sit, let's say, at some distance yeah. from the horizon. Right. You send the clock. Drop it. Uh, right. Wait for some time. Yeah. Period. Yeah. In that sense, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yes. That's that, that's so. All right. So good. Yeah. All right. Now, of course. You're going to boost invariant slice. Of course, if you continue to wait, uh, it's most likely uh, things kind of fluctuate up in here. But if you continue, and every so often an extra big uh, bump will happen in the, in the complexity. But if you wait long enough, there will be quantum recurrences. Quantum recurrences take place on scales of e to the e to the s. Everything gets bumped up by an exponential when you go from entropy to complexity. So wait, I'm confused. But you said the bound on complexity is e to the s. Uh, I, uh, e means E to the S stands for exponential in S. Right. That's the time scale that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. It's the time scale E to the S that you're talking about. Well, well, yes, yes, yes. So it's the no, the ma both the magnitude well. and, the, uh, and the time scale. It's linear. It grows linearly <laughs> with a polynomial, um, well, just proportion to S. And um, it, uh, it saturates at a time e to the s, at a magnitude also of order e to the s. And um, when I say of order e to the s, I mean of order e to a constant, positive constant times s. Okay. So some power in the dimension of the Hilbert space. No. Yeah. All right. Okay. I would call, I would, I would call these black holes when they're in here. During that period, the volume is expanding. And um, 
they're behaving, the interior is behaving stably. If you wait long enough, I'll just draw a cartoon of this. You'll go back down and back up and so forth. Quantum recurrences. Here is where this really looks unstable to me. This is when you're in the situation when the complexity is decreasing, only temporarily, it'll go back up. Uh, the volume of the Einstein, the einstein rosen bridge is presumably contracting during this period, and that is where you're effectively in the bottom half of the diagram. He is surely unstable there. So I would call these white holes over here. And I don't really know what goes on here. I don't know what goes on in this vast plateau. I'll call it gray holes, neither white nor black, somewhere in between, fluctuating around. Are there firewalls in there? I don't know. Uh, is there a probability of a firewall in there? I don't know. But I'm going to take the worst case scenario. I'm just going to assume, worst case for me is that there are firewalls. I'm going to assume that this whole plateau could conceivably be full of firewalls. If that were the case, then the fraction of time, the fraction of time spent as a black hole would be of order e to the minus e to the s. And yet, all black holes that would be created in nature, black holes and created in nature are necessarily created at low complexity. You can't create a thing in a short amount of time with exponential complexity. All black holes created in nature would begin their life somewhere down here. And so for a very, very long time, they would be black holes. And I think they would be stable here. Len? Yeah. I'm confused about something in the single-sided case. <clears throat> in the single-sided case? Single in the single-sided case. case. Are you going to sustain it by having some flux come in? Or, you know, the oh. black hole, of course, decays. Uh, oh, 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 this is ADS. And you're assuming yeah, it helps. Yeah. Well, so how okay. should I think about it in flat space? Then? You can't think about this in flat space because it'll evaporate. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. So I should have said in the beginning, yeah. my black holes are in boxes so that they don't evaporate. If they evaporate... And they're big, I guess. They're big. And they're big. Yeah. Right. If they evaporate, typically they'll evaporate long before e to the s. So, you know, so, so the... the um, the thing I think where we have the most control and can say the most probably is for the black holes, which are stabilized by being an anti dissider space. But also in your formula, LADS appears explicitly. Yes. If you take that to infinity. Yeah. There's, a, there's another formula where it doesn't appear explicitly uh, that was uh, worked out by Adam Brown. And it has um, what, it, what it really is proportional to is the entropy times the hyperbolic boost angle from here to here. It's just a dimensionless number. The uh, the entropy times the hyperbolic boost angle from here to here. It's also that's a kind of length along here. So it's an entropy times a length, and it's a volume divided by gn times LADS. Is it kind of the same as the proper time of someone who falls in, right? Because that that would be ADS for these black holes, but for Minkowski ones, it would be the short time. Sorry, I didn't understand. The time you live from horizon crossing to hitting the <coughs> Hitting the singularity. Yeah, so that's always. That's LADS. That, yeah, yeah, so oh, you say you want you could scale it that way. I might, I might just I might get replaced by that time. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, a given observer sees only his own causal patch, and because he sees his own causal patch, I, that, that comes back to what I said in the first place. I would like to say that there is a kind of complexity bound on the kind of experiments that can be done in here, but that's another issue. But in any case, you want your black hole to evolve unitarily without interacting with some external that's system. Right. But for the moment, yeah, certainly. Right. Okay. So it seems like this is basically the same as what we would have said if you believe in linear quantum mechanics. You have that as the argument for the firewall, except that you've, you've given us an extra E in front of you. Yeah. In front of everything. Right? But I, you know, is, that worth the, is, that, is that worth the price of nonlinear quantum mechanics? Just put an extra e to that in front of everything before things go wrong. I don't. I don't know that we ever have to do nonlinear quantum mechanics, but um, a nonlinear dictionary. I suspect we do have to do deal with, and I don't know, that's what I'm going to talk about next. Um, one other piece of language that I like is to say that there are two kinds of equilibria. 
One kind of equilibrium is thermal equilibrium. That's when entropy reaches its maximum. Okay. The other kind of equilibrium, which, is, which doesn't really make sense for classical physics, is complexity equilibrium, when the complexity maxes out like this. Now, there's very good reasons why condensed matter physicists and other people who study the usual properties of matter don't care about this complexity. It's too, it's too uh, subtle to, uh, for it to ever be um, meaningfully measured. But it does seem to have something to do with the interior of black holes, where it just seems to be less subtle, curiously. <coughs> OK, so let's talk about linearity, this issue. Yeah. Can you just remind us this statement that the complexity ma maxes out at the dimensionality of the Hilbert space? That's not about. I mean, that's for a generic system, right? Yeah. Is, that, is there some group oh, well, this, I would say this is probably pretty much right for any strongly coupled system. Is it that that is the maximum complexity in the whole Hilbert space, or the yes. maximum yes. that's reached yes. by this process? No. Good question. Very good question. OK, so the maximal complexity in the whole Hilbert space is this big. Cannot get bigger than that. You can prove that uh, any unitary operator, let's talk about, let's talk about unitary operators in the states, it's a little easier, that any unitary operator can be constructed by an exponential number of gates. So you cannot have more complexity than that. That doesn't mean the circuit can't run longer. The circuit can run forever and ever and ever. But what happens is that when it runs too long, there are shortcuts in the, uh, in the um, shortcuts to get there faster. So yeah, e to the s is the maximal complexity in the Hilbert space. And the assumption of this drawing, there are two bounds. One is that it can't grow faster than a certain thing. One is it can't get bigger than this. And I've made the assumption that, um, that the bound is saturated. The very, t the very uh, small time effects of chaos, of course, the Lyapunov coefficients and the scrambling. The saturation of the scrambling by, um, you know, by the, by Juan and Steve and so forth, and Douglas, that's a short time version of saturation. I'm just making the assumption that, uh, that it's saturated for long times. Scott Aronson and I will have a paper out about this at some point. Okay, so now all, what all of this brings up is the question of whether, whether of linearity, of the linearity of quantum mechanics. And the reason it comes up is because you might think that the difference between being a black hole and a white hole, um, or a black hole and gray or white hole, that ought to define some proper subspace of a, uh, of a Hilbert space. Not if this picture is right. Certainly, the whole set of states up here which is huge, is way over complete. And even this set of states here is, probably, is, is over complete. So the, if this picture is right, it means that there are superpositions of gray hole states which make black hole states. There are even superpositions of black hole states which make white hole states. Why do I say that? Because complexity is not something that is described by a linear operator. Two states which may have low complexity, if you were to superpose them in a quantum superposition, may very well have enormously large complexity. So complexity is not something that follows the rules of standard quantum mechanics. It's not, a, it's not an observable. We can argue about whether somebody falling into a black hole should describe what they see by a linear observable or not. Um, I would argue no. Perhaps Don would argue yes. Uh, but I think uh, I would like to pursue the line of direction that follows from this and see what we learn. OK, so given then that there has to be some kind of nonlinearity for this picture to make sense, Let's talk about observables behind the horizon a little bit. Here, I, I certainly don't have a theory of the observables behind the horizon. 
just some interesting remarks. Let's take the two-sided case for a moment. I want to show you some examples of why the observables have to be state-dependent. Now, what state-dependent means nonlinear, uh, nonlinear operators, but I'm going to call them state-dependent. If an operator depends on what state it operates on, then it's a nonlinear operator. Uh, so, let me show you some examples. One example. I'm only going to show you one example. Here's our thermal field double state. For now, this could be the genuine thermal field double state. And let's talk about two modes. Here's a mode that I will call A, and it corresponds to a, uh, a mode I now mean a behind-the-horizon field mode, which is propagating upward to the right. And how far in is it? Well, it's, it's, far, it's, it's, into, the, it's into the black hole interior some distance. Maybe even an order ADS distance, but it doesn't matter too much. Let's put it in there in a substantial way so that it's uh, not too close to the horizon. And that mode is supposed to be paired with another mode outside the horizon, which I'll call B. And they're supposed to be entangled. The picture that you can draw is that they were somehow created as an entangled or hawking pair. OK, so there's, uh, there's our two modes, A and B, one outside the horizon and one inside the horizon. And I want to know, first of all, how B is encoded in the CFT, and then how A is encoded in the, B, in the, in the CFT. B is easy. We have a set of rules that were given to us by Hamilton, uh, Kabat, uh, help. Lipschitz. Lipschitz and Lowe. Yeah. yeah. All right, and they say that you can uh, take B and relate it to stuff on the boundary here. I like working in the Schrodinger picture, so I would be inclined to take the things that are on the, on the boundary here, use the equations of motion to relate them to something at t equals 0 or at the same time. And then this operator becomes somewhat complex, but not terribly complex, because this isn't too close to the horizon. The closer it is to the horizon, the more integration you have to do. If it's not too close to the horizon, you get some kind of, uh, you get some kind of expression in the CFT, in the Schrodinger picture, for what B is. Okay. What about A? Well, you can't do the same thing for A, but you can say what in the CFT is maximally entangled with B. A is supposed to be something maximally entangled with B, and I'm thinking of A and B as qubits for the moment. What is it that's maximally entangled? What is the degree of freedom that is maximally entangled with B? And the answer is, it's a reflected mode over here. It's a reflected mode over here. I'll call that A prime. This is the same uh, notation that Juan and I used, calling that A prime over here. And of course, A prime can also be represented in the boundary CFT. So we have a candidate for what operator uh, to identify with A, with this mode over here, it's just A prime, and A prime we can represent holographically on the left there. Okay, <clears throat> I'm basically finished with this particular uh, construction over here, but now I want to go on and do another similar construction, except that now sometime long in the past, somebody has dropped in one very low energy particle into the right side here. So it comes in along here. Very, very long in the past, either Steve Schenker or Douglas Stanford or somebody dropped in a very, very low energy particle in the past over here. By the time you get to t equals 0, where b is, the effect of that particle that was dropped in is comparable to having dropped in one extra particle into this room and waiting a billion years. It becomes indistinguishable. You can't find it. The right-hand black hole here is back in complete thermal equilibrium. No <coughs> recognizable remnant of having dropped this in. The left-hand black hole has been unchanged altogether. There is one slight remnant, and that's that the energy of the right-hand black hole is slightly bigger by a very small amount 
ignore that. Okay, but what happens in the interior of the black hole? What happens in the interior of the black hole is a huge hit the interior takes, an enormously high energy shock wave. It was flying out along here, very close to the horizon. And that shock wave really distorts the geometry. I drew the Penrose diagram the same way. Strictly speaking, I should have drawn the Penrose diagram like this. Uh, but I'll draw it this way. I'll leave it this way. Now let's try our reconstruction of A. A is over here. B is over here. And now we want to run A backward and see where it goes and see what, uh, what kind of operator. The lesson from here, of course, is that A prime is just the thing in the causal past of A, which is really the same mode. If we ran A backward by solving the equation of motion backward, where would it go? Well, it would run back to where the shock wave was. And when it hits the shock wave, first of all, it gets splattered. A terrific mess is made, but it also gets shifted. It gets shifted down to here. You can see that over here. <coughs> here's, your, here's one side of the black hole. Here's the other side. And if you're up over here and you run backward, you wind up in the soup, in the singularity. So how do I reconstruct what A is? First of all, first observation, there is a big change in, although it was a tiny perturbation in some sense, it made a huge change in what the, um, the representation of A might be. It's all of a sudden shifted back to here. Is there a way to figure out what operator is actually associated with this? So I will tell you that there is. Here's the trick. You start with the thermal field double state. Now I'm going to assume that the thermal field double state is a maximally entangled state of qubits between the left and the right. That's not exactly true but it's approximately true. Maximal entanglement between a set of n qubits on this side and n qubits on this side. What is true about the maximally entangled state is if you apply any unitary, the unitary in this case being the unitary which created the shock wave, W. W is the notation for creating a shock wave. W is a unitary operator in the past. So my state is W times the thermal field double. W times the thermal field double. Um, that's the state I'm, I'm starting with. And I, what, what I'm trying to do is to construct the operator that is maximally entangled with B on this side. That's what I want to construct. The operator maximally entangled with B. And it looks like it's a horrible mess. Okay, so W on the thermal field double is my initial state. Um, what do I want to do with it? Well, you want to conjugate it by W, probably. Yeah. No, not yet. Not yet. Not yet. You got to do a trick first. This is W on the right side. What you want to do is replace this. This is W at time TW, which is negative. TW is negative, acting on the thermal field double. I will write that this is equal to W on the left side at minus TW acting on the thermal field double. Now, if you know about maximally entangled states, you will know that for any unitary that acts on one half of the maximally entangled set, there is another unitary that acts on the opposite side of the system. And that will be, in this case, it will be the shock wave way up here in the corner, reflected symmetrically about this 45-degree uh, angle here, this 45-degree angle here. Now, you might say, is this really, are they really exactly the same thing, acting with this shock wave over here and this shock wave over here? No, they're not. But in the limit that the time gets very low, so it gets very, very close to the horizon, they become the same. They're close enough that, uh, that we can identify a perturbation up here, which creates a shock wave along here, with a perturbation down here. 
Why don't you just want to use the one on the right? Why, why bother? I'll, I'll show you in a minute. I'll show you in a minute. All right. So I'm going to substitute the thermal field double state, this state, and now ask. Now I want to write out the condition that A and B here are maximally entangled. Okay. So here's the condition. A and B are qubit operators. They each have x, y, and z components. A dot B. I'll assume they're in the singlet state, that A and B are two qubits in the singlet state. And that means that when they act on the thermal field double state, they give question, examination now. What do they give? <laughs> Zero, one. Minus three. That's because it's a sigma x, sigma x, sigma y, sigma y, sigma z, sigma z. They're all anti-aligned. So you get minus three times the thermal field double. This is the definition for me now of being maximally entangled in the right state for a smooth horizon, that they're, that they're maximally entangled in this, in, in this state. OK, that's, and, that, and what is A that satisfies this? A that satisfies this is just good old A prime. That's the thing which satisfied it. So let's just call it A prime. A prime dot B did that. Now I'm looking for another operator. I don't know, I'll give it another name, A double prime. Such that in this state, they B, it's now not hitting the thermal field double, it's hitting W left of minus T times the thermal field double. I'll just call it T. That that's equal to minus 3 times W left times the thermal field double. I've just replaced the thermal field double by the shock wave and A prime by A double prime. OK, so here's how I solve this. Not very clever. You just conjugate by W left. But W left commutes with B. Daniel, here's the reason. Because mm -hmm. W left commutes with B. So B can come out of this, and one finds that a, that a double prime, W, A double prime, W must be A prime. The new operator that represents A is just the old operator conjugated by the shock wave operator. That's, that's, the, uh, that's the lesson. Conjugated, the shock wave creates a background, and in this background you have to conjugate by the effect of the shock wave. Okay. So it's a statement about how it acts on this particular state. It's a statement about how it acts on this particular state. Okay, so it's not that the operators are the same. No. How it acts on this particular state. Right. Here you could throw up your hands and say, oh my god, state dependence. Or you can pursue it and see what you learn. Okay, so let's pursue it and see what we learn for at least a little bit. I mean, I'm running out of time. but uh... All right, so I now have a formula. I have a formula that A double prime is equal to W left. Now, let me remember what W left is. As, as I said before, I like working in the Schrodinger picture because it reveals all of the complexity, both technical complexity and uh, uh, A double prime is W dagger left. Now, that's some U where U is the time translation operator up to there times W in the, I'm not going to write lefts and rights all over the place, and then I'll just sketch it. W here is the Schrodinger picture operator for creating a uh, time-independent, uh, ordinary Schrodinger picture, times U dagger. That's the Heisenberg operator that uh, corresponds to this up here. Uh, that's W, and then there's A prime. And then there's U, W dagger, U dagger. That's the new A double prime. This is the operator that you'll have to put in to be, this is the operator which in the Schrodinger picture will be the thing which is maximally entangled with B. And it's state dependent. It's certainly state dependent. It only works on the state. Every time you change the state, it happens. Now I want to ask, how different is A double prime from A prime? Maybe they're the same operator. Well, they're not. 
Uh, but let's try to see how different they are by asking about their relative complexity. Remember, relative complexity was a measure of how different these things are in the Hilbert space. So what you do is you take A double prime and multiply it by A prime inverse. Now, if you want the relative complexity of two operators, you take one and you multiply it by the inverse of the other, and then you consider the complexity of the whole thing. So what we want to consider, then, is the complexity of the object U, W, U dagger, A prime, U, W dagger, U dagger, A prime, another A prime. I'm multiplying A double prime by A prime. It's a big monstrous mess here. But what it corresponds to is not that really that complicated. It corresponds to a time evolution from t equals 0 to the place where w is inserted, and then a time evolution back to where a prime is um, inserted, and then a time evolution up again to where w dagger is inserted, and then a time evolution back down, and then a prime is inserted again. But let me, I don't understand. Was A prime defined <laughs> acting on any state except the thermofield double? It, it's defined on any state, but it's only, uh, it's only the relevant thing that represents A on that state. It's, it's a Schrodinger picture operator, so it's an operator. So, so A prime was not, A prime was defined as that That's operator you get propagating all the way back to the boundary and thinking of it as a normal linear operator in quantum mechanics. A yeah. prime is not state dependent, yeah. only a double yeah. prime. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And I've arranged, it, I've arranged it in such a way that you don't, that B is over here, A is over here, so uh, so A prime is not way back in the past. Okay. I put all the time dependence in where I sh uh, shot in the shot rate. Okay, fine. Yeah. Okay, now, how complex is this operator? This is the kind of operator that Douglas and I studied uh, in calculating complexity and relating it to a volume and so forth. But I can tell you quickly what the complexity of this operator is. You need a certain number of gates proportional to t. Let me just call it t, the number of uh, gates to go forward. Uh, that's proportional to the time, or uh, the time of w, tw, or the magnitude of tw. Then there's one extra gate. This is a simple operator. You just drop in a photon. I'll ignore it. It's in the, uh, it's in the uh, noise. All right. And then there's another tw to go back and then another small perturbation, altogether roughly 4TW. That's how many extra gates are put in by this time fold here. OK, but that's not exactly right. I won't try to explain, but I will write down the right answer. The right answer is that there is some cancellation. Cancellation at these turning points here. There are four turning points where the time fold turns back, and at each turning point, there's a minus t scrambling. t scrambling is beta over 2 pi log s, log of the entropy. There's a cancellation. What is true is something like this, that the complexity of this thing is negligible until the time gets up to about the scrambling time, and then it takes off. There's not much, not much complexity generated. And the implication of that, I think, is that A prime and A double prime are not very different. I'm going to say that they're exponentially close to each other. I think that's right. Uh, that A prime and A double prime do not deviate significantly until the time back here gets to be a world of scrambling time, and then it starts to increase. And then it starts to increase. OK, and that's. I'm sorry. It, 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 if you're not pushing it far back, then you don't have much of a shock wave. Except that's the point. Yeah, so you don't have much of back. You, that's, yeah, the point. Okay, no, that's, that's the point. The that's the point. That's the point. Yeah, there's no. If you don't push it far back, there's not much of a shock wave. You don't pass, pass through very much. And then it's a sort of exponential kind of thing. Well, that, uh, kind of a, it's a power kind of thing, right? There's, cause there's, a, there's a G Newton, and then there's something growing. The way you get this kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, but the way, the, way the, um, 
what we call the size of the operator, the, 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 the magnitude of the commutator that you calculate. That grows exponentially. <coughs> Yeah, no, it's growing exponentially, but but the idea is you have G Newton times the growing exponential. Yeah. So it's it's so if the growing oh, yes, exponential yes, is yes. one, then it's exactly, down exactly. by a power of G Newton. You're right on. That's yeah. right. 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 That's correct. So I mean that's uh, which is connected with what Gary said. If you don't go very far back, you're just talking about a low energy collision over here, yeah. gravitational <laughs> psychology. That's exactly I mean that is a little weird though, because you would have thought powers of G Newton would be things that sort of ordinary perturbation theory would be uh, well, okay, I, 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 I'm just telling you what I know. I'm not yeah, going yeah. beyond what I know. Okay, so what does that say? That says that A prime and A double prime are close. I don't know exactly how close. I don't, want to, I don't want to try to quantify. They're close until about the scrambling time, and then they take off. Okay. Uh, that's state dependence. Now, how dangerous is this? How dangerous is this? Um, in particular, how observable would the phase? There are two states I'm considering. I'm considering the thermal field double, and I'm considering possibly a superposition together with thermal field double prime, where <laughs> thermal field double prime is what you get when you throw in the shock wave. I'm interested, and plus or minus could be any phase. My question is, what operator do I use for this state? Okay, what operator do I use for this state? This is what all this linearity has to do with. I use one operator for TFD. I use another operator for TFD. What operator do I use for this? Um, my answer is that if this is sufficiently different, if it's back down here, then I don't believe that it's possible to interfere them from within the black hole. Why not? Because the, the um, relative complexity of it, I didn't write about the relative complexity of the two states, but the relative complexity of the two states also shows this uh, behavior of jumping up at the, uh, com at the uh, scrambling time. The relative complexity of these two states is very small until it's suddenly big. When it's suddenly big, I claim that you can't measure interference between them anymore. Why not? Because it would take an apparatus which was big enough and complex enough to cause a transition between the two of them. And they have a large relative complexity. The relative complexity would be of order S log S, to be exact, at the scrambling time. So I think this is not a danger, because I don't think uh, there's any. How do you deal with this, uh, this superposition of states? I would say since you cannot measure, no apparatus can measure the relative phase, you might as well just say from the inside that it's an incoherent superposition with random phase. And, uh, and I don't think you'll get into trouble that way. OK, so. Uh, All right, Lenny, so if, I, if you let me take time, the time to be small, yeah. then um, I think by then roughly by measuring, you know, I'm roughly measuring a correlation function that involves this operator down here that makes the, the you know, that, that makes this, this thing, mm -hmm. together with maybe some operators up here, but it's some, you know, some And they're all, all outside? Uh, well, maybe some inside, too. I don't know. Uh, okay. No, but it's short time. It's short times. Oh, okay. It, uh, short compared to the scrambling. Right. Group. Then, right. then it's some correlation function uh, right. involving things inside right. and outside, right? Right. Then I, don't think it, then I would say the operator isn't significantly state dependent. Well, sure. good, but I think the effect you're talking about, we just agreed, will be down by power of Newton. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, but does that mean that we'll see a violation of quantum mechanics, sort of in perturbation theory? I mean, that, I find that. I think it's important to understand what the limits of quantum mechanics are behind the horizon. Yeah, I mean, this I'm, I'm a, giving you some extreme situations, and the extreme situations, I would say, there's an enormous effect, but it just simply boils down to something you can't measure. Yeah. And the other extreme, it's. It's not very important because the two operators are not significantly different. And then there's an interesting question of so what happens in between yeah. and uh, the limits of quantum mechanics uh, between. Now, here, here is this is what this S log S is a big number. If you have an extremely big black hole, and what complementarity, although it may not have been stated in the original paper, what it was meant to intend to, uh, to apply to, 
is you have an op, a, a laboratory of a given size. It could be all of SLAC, or it could be all of the LHC, or it could be, uh, it could be the solar system. They're all experiments that you could throw in here. Now, you, you fix a scale. You say, the experiment is no bigger than radius L, and I'm not going to be interested in anything that happens after a time of order L. So we're talking about straddling the horizon by that much. That for experiments of this type, they should tend to the flat space limit in the limit that the black hole gets big. That was what I meant by, I don't think I really spelled this out in the paper, but that is what I meant by black hole complementarity, that in this limit of a big black hole and a finite size experiment. Now, for a finite size experiment, I'm inclined to think that the, um, that the complexity cutoff would be of order the, ent the entropy itself, I think. I think. Right? And S log S would be much, much bigger. So I think for these kind of experiments, I think you're always in a safe region where the relative complexity is much smaller than the scrambling relative complexity, where, where the complexity cutoff is. Uh, but like uh, tidal forces, that, that size of thing, I mean, that also goes to zero. In this yeah, case. yeah, that was the point. But, that, but, that was but the point. That, you, that, I mean, you expect probably those would still, there wouldn't be other effects besides tidal forces. That That's the question. Are there, are, there force, are there effects bigger than tidal forces? Yeah, yeah. Right. So I don't know the answer. I mean, I'm not saying this fixes everything. I'm saying it fixes some extreme situations, among which I think is what I originally intended by black hole complementarity. OK. That, um, I, could, I could finish right here, and I will finish right here. I, could, I was going to say a few words about um, the paper that I'm writing with Scott Aronson. Um, Yeah, Lenny, does anything interesting happen uh, when you, you can imagine a situation where you get two states, thermal field double state and thermal field double state prime, that uh, dig, uh, differ significantly in complexity, but there are situations where the, uh, the two the relations between A prime and A double prime are still pretty simple. For instance, if you have a shock wave confined to a certain, you know, a local shock wave oh. in one area, then, then elsewhere, um, does that, does that, uh, I don't know. I don't know. Um, <laughs> I would refer you to my friend, uh, my friends Douglas and Dan uh, Roberts. <laughs> I see. I'll ask him. So Ready. Did he now give a, a proposal for the maximal complexity distance between two states in a black hole? Which you can. I think it's e to the s. E to the s. Yeah. 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 So there's no question that you can form superpositions of anything you want from outside the black hole. I do not want to restrict that or make any restrictions on the class of states that Alice and Bob can prepare their, their thing in, whatever the thing is. No restrictions, whatever. I am saying that, I, that it feels to me like from within the black hole, there are limits on how big an experiment can be. And those limits will limit the relative complexity of two states that can be superposed. That's, that's, that's the message, or that's the, uh, that's the proposal. There were some papers by um, Nomura and company saying something vaguely similar in regards Is that to right? positions. Well, I, I, I you could be right, and uh, I hope you are, because I would like some uh, I would like some compatriots in this. Um, but that's that's it. I could uh, I could say a couple of words about. Um, you know, uh, I, I think I'll quit. I think I'll quit. Exactly. Uh, uh, and exactly. Do right. right. So right. my question then is. No, no. Okay, let me just. Yeah. So my question is the relationship between between 
states that can be distinguished on the basis of semiquantum yeah. complexity. When you say semiquantum, you mean, yeah, okay. We, talk, we, we sometimes talk about backgrounds, right. approximate, the approximate notion so, so of background. Think about them as being a bit different yeah. background. I think when the complexity difference between them is bigger than a certain amount, then we can think of them as separate backgrounds. And if it's smaller than that, we shouldn't think of them as separate backgrounds. But, but, um, but does that also mean like any state that has a classical, uh, back, that correspond to a classical background are actually simple ones compared to those which don't? Compared to yeah, I, I think any state that has a classical background is probably simpler. Is probably simpler than one which is way up on the top of the plateau there, which uh, doesn't have a. Another you know. related question. So, so uh, we can have systems, which are. I mean, we have quantum systems, but they they have a complexity of a classical chaos. So they they like. They, they have chaos, but but it's only just classical chaos. So so so. So, so I, I, I would guess uh, it looks like a black hole from outside because that, that kind of complexity is enough to give you a black hole. From the outside, it looks like a black hole. So, so what will be the, is there a geometrical interpretation of these kind of states? Or, or Which kind of states now? The states that only has classical complexity in their evolution. Well, I'm not sure how it's they can like only have you classical have, I mean, complexity if they quantum. Chaotic, but I'm not exactly sure what you're asking. Um, you can have Hamiltonians which are chaotic, but, yeah. but it doesn't evolve a state to a generic state. It's just like, like there is a bunch of poly operators which are right. committing C, uh, taking C max to C on Y or Z. And like a swap, of, I think, right? Yeah, it's like a random uh, uh, classical circuit, which can oh, give you a... Oh, 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 oh. You a sorry, sorry. Cellular automata. Yeah. Oh, okay. Which has chaos, but it's classical. Uh, that's right. Good. A classical sem a, a, a classical semi cellular automaton. cellular automaton is a special case, of course, of a quantum network of a quantum uh, of a quantum device. Um, the complexity of the cellular automaton never gets very large. It, it basically never gets larger than the number of qubits. So um, I'm. I don't know if there's anything special about states which are generated uh, that look like classical atomic. I, I don't know. Um, so, but uh, they will definitely not be the states which are up on the complexity plateau. Those are exponentially larger uh, complexity. Yeah. So is there something in this that you know that uh, Gerard has been writing these papers saying the world might actually be a classical automaton that we're looking at. In the I, I don't see any connection. I followed, you know, I, I learned my lesson about ignoring Girard a long time ago. You don't ignore him. What I'm way. asking is whether these complexity things could somehow falsify that claim. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose so. <laughs> Good. <laughs> okay. I, 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 yeah. I mean, maybe, maybe he just has exponentially many things in his cellular automaton. Well, I think uh, I don't no, think he intended that to be the case. I don't think he intended that to be the case. He thought of his cells as Planckian cells. Yeah. yeah. You can't even get Bellman qualities, right? Oh. right? Okay. Now, <laughs> now I see where you're going. Thank you. <laughs> Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.